This is uh, one of the musical duets, duets or duets, that uh, I've been writing for for the last um, number of years. And the idea is to explore the uh, intersections between the real and the virtual. And I think there's quite a lot of things that uh, are still uncertain in terms of, uh, especially how we do perceive the performance of the piece. So normally we will uh, perform facing like a pianist, half of the screen, I will do that, and then the performer will be facing the uh, audience with a uh, score in front, uh, another copy of the exactly the same screen there, and it might have, or not, depending on the piece, instructions that are come alongside the, the dynamic score, which is the, the game engine. Uh, so it's a combination of both. Um, this piece is more participative, so it's more like an improvised um, performance rather than just a battle. But some others are based on very specific studies on rhythm, texture, timbre, and then we compete actually. We, it's more like a kind of game competition. But the structure is always the same, so one acts first and then the other one replies, as in beatboxing or things like that. And then the third part within the scene or the same, um, let's say, round, is combined. So we, we play together. So competition is not uh, the only thing, it's also cooperation. And I think uh, it's much more interesting musically, because, you know, ensembles work that way. You know, musicians are very competitive, some of them. Um, but also, when you work as an ensemble or as a group, you realize that it's not just about being the soloist, you need to have a very good team and understand each other and so on. So the, the, the idea of exploring that concept as part of the piece, it will make the battles quite uh, unique and I think uh, interesting to watch and interesting to experience. If you just do competition, as a guitar hero and so on, it becomes something, something else. So the question as a composer and also as a performer is, there are many questions arising that I don't think I, I would be able to solve in my lifetime, but since quite a few people are working on the same problems, you know, really Rob Hamilton, when he was here, also working with virtual instruments, is, uh, for example, one of them is, what do we watch when uh, we um, experience a performance like that? And, and this is a question that is not just uh, a problem in this kind of uh, performances, but also in, in double screening. So, for example, BBC might be looking at what do you watch when you're watching tele, interactive television, and then when you work with your iPad as well what content was where, um, how could you design a program or a TV show that exactly reflects that inter level of interactivity. The level of interac interactivity in this piece is quite, uh, you know, sort of sample based, so it's more about interacting between the musicians. But there's no reason why I could use 
um, interactivity within the, the audio engine on the virtual avatars using real-time synthesis or anything like that. Um, all the questions that I've been looking at is how do the performers experience the, the, the music? How, what sort of a kind of performer is more suitable for this kind of experience? And how could you solve a score that can be rehearsed in one hour, or maybe two hours? It's quite challenging, but you want to do musical battles, you don't have like, a lot of time to uh, prepare them. So I normally send materials in advance, as we did. And then it's just a matter of finding a framework for improvisation with musical directions that we can think in terms of very basic, basic concepts, collisions, visual cues, uh, musical directions, and question and answer. So thus, you work with these three or four parameters, more or less, the, you can put something together very quickly. Um, but I have all the um, performances, for example, for bass clarinet, it's one of the first ones I wrote that I work completely in the opposite way. I composed the piece first and then uh, deconstructed the piece, thinking in terms of how these events will, will um, unfold across time. So that the piece, for example, takes place in the Expo 58, uh, the Philips Pavilion and you know, the Atomic Pavilion and so on. So this is kind of the first level. And then what you have to do is to collect these different parts of the instrument. Um, and it works similarly than it is with you know, bubbles and there's text, there's a storyline talking to you about it. Once you have collected the instruments, you have to collect the performer and then you have to collect the uh, composer. The composer is, you know, you can select a number of uh, people, but they are normally in a, in a kind of a capsule. And you also have to select the, the instrument of the, the composer, it's a real to real. Um, and then the second level is more sort of the performance itself. So the, the score is a physical score that you can actually have to follow and read. It's a standard notation with extended techniques, but it's displayed on, in the virtual world. So the performer has to follow up, and I have to do the tone pages and everything. So, but one of the first things we discover is that when we scanned our bodies in the School of Materials in Manchester, high poly uh, 3D models of ourselves, the performer and myself, it was a bit boring. So we, we, see the, we saw the, the results and it was not very convincing. And also, if you question, same as in computer music, you work with a, um, an extension of an instrument, what's the point of mimicking reality? So you want to do something that the, the acoustic instrument cannot do. Same here, you want to represent something which goes beyond the virtual representation. There must be a reason for that. So what we did is to create humanoids working that were constructed with bones made of part of the instrument. And it was quite funny, and uh, people like that, you know, thinking about the feedback we, we received. So, but that was a different concept, it was more deconstructing a, a, a piece, that, you know, coming from my tradition and saying, how can I unfold that in the 3D world? You think differently, you think about the game engine in, in itself, and you're not, you don't have so much uh, of an issue with the idea of people interpreting your compositions as games or you know, gamified experiences. They can actually work a much better, a profound uh, way by using the engine to, let's say, think about how to take full advantage of the engine. And the engine has a physics engine, a graphics engine, an AI engine as well and also a, uh, an audio engine, of course. So you can, now I um, have two engines, audio engines here, so you can use Max or, uh, or the audio engine, within Unreal in this case. But this, you think about these sort of five engines, there's a lot of things that you can do that are specifically native or inherited to the, the, the tool. And it makes you think differently, but at the same time, it's a better use of the software. Um, and I don't have a, much of an issue in, in, in following that structure because I've seen what I can achieve from the other point of view. For example, if you think about AI in gaming, it's actually quite, quite interesting. Normally it's, it's designed for enemies to follow you, but you have occlusion, you can hide. So you can think in terms of uh, creating voids around you and then hiding 
and then if you hide, they will not follow you. And thinking about this movement within, within the scene to create a choreography of the sound. So you narrate a single sound in every one. And uh, I do that for another piece called the Ethertrum, Ether and, and um, uh, Spectrum together. And it's very interesting to see how a game, uh, taking advantage of a specific aspect of the engine, can produce musical results that are very difficult to achieve otherwise. Uh, for the physics engine, of course, it's very, it's very useful as well. And um, but one of the limitations at the minute, maybe not so much in the last couple of years, but one of the things I found is that you always have to use an external audio engine if you want to do real-time um, or procedural audio, meaning that you have to pipe the data from an audio application, Max, Super Collider, and so on, into the 3D objects to create a sense of kinesis between the two. And this is not very efficient. Uh, uh, also, for example, for this piece, OSC, uh, the last version is for Unreal is for uh, 417, that was a few months ago, and now we are in 421. So you cannot stop the... So it's a bit of an issue that I don't really want to deal with. Um, but now, the audio engine, thank you to Aaron McLean and, uh, of course, uh, Unreal Engine, um, sorry, um, the Unreal people that hire an audio engineer to do the audio part, they implemented the uh, sound synthesis within the engine, uh, audio in capabilities, without going to need to go elsewhere, uh, grammar synthesis, and also there was uh, FFT analysis in real, um, Signal. It's not real time, but it's kind of a signal processing. You can do FFT analysis of um, dynamic audio, so dynamics and, um, and uh, frequency. So you can create a number of beams to detect frequency. Normally, use most people use it for um, sequencers and kind of lighting sequencers. What do you call that? Like audio sync. But I've been using that to, for example use audio to mm, scale th things in the, in the real time. Scale things not in real time, but in real, in, in, in playback time, as you perform. So you render the audio and then it will scale objects. And it's quite realistic because you can see things re uh, responding to sound. So the rest is just how would you create a musical context to connect all these different engines within the engine that make the experience unique to the listener. Um, Aesthetics-wise, also, it's a bit of an issue because most people, when they come to these performances, so we have uh, the first uh, musical battle for saxophone quartet in Spain, like two weeks ago. I think they, they, when they were asking questions, it was a demo concert, a demo performance. Mm, I hear a lot of times the, the word game because they cannot get away from that concept. Whereas I don't, I don't see these as games, I see them as, as composition. You, you, you compose a piece, I don't think we never discuss the idea of game, we sort of always talk about an improvised performance. But the technology is so inherited to that gaming experience that people can re really disassociate from it. And I found this actually as an advantage, but also as a, as a problem. Because um, I don't have the problem with that calling something or using the word game, but some people do have that problem. Uh, in education context, of course, you, you work, uh, uh, um, you say the word game, it has a lot of connotations, whereas you say interacting performance environments and so on, it sounds really pretty cool, but it's actually a game course, a game audio course, uh, even if you call it uh, digital entertainment technologies. So. I try not to focus on the technology so much, so I forget about it, and I'm trying to think about how your compositional mind can use this technology just to create cool stuff, you know, create music and uh, spaces of interaction that were not possible otherwise. The more we know about the engines, the, the more they improve the audio aspects to it, I think the more potential for getting something that could be like ultimately the um, next generation of uh, fun. Any questions on that? Um, yeah, um, I have a question for if, uh, uh, do you have also like a composition where uh, the performer 
because in in uh, in this composition mm -hmm. you controlling the game engine which is a score. Yes. Uh, but do you have also compositions where the performer via some performing some notes or some figures um, controlling the game? Uh, yeah, yeah, the game. Uh, for the uh, per, um, saxophones for Ted Patton, we play a kind of a, kind of a funny representation of Paul. So I made references to archive games in that, in that particular piece. I think it's fun. Mm -hmm. And then you see these two sort of um, puddles just moving up and down. And then this is a st st like a standard poem. Mm -hmm. And then the physics starts changing. So the gravity of the objects start moving around and it falls apart. But um, I moved that with a, a MIDI controller. Mm -hmm. I can use MIDI now in, in Real Engine. And the performer moves that with a Mayo R band. Mm -hmm. so, where, mm -hmm. yeah. so with the Mayo you can actually just control any kilometer and not using the bio sensors or the, the biometric sensors or the, you know, the EMG sensors. But the question is how much movement do you have when you are playing? He's a tenor, so it was the tenor was using a tenor saxophone. So normally you can do that the most, not all the time. So he was actually using that, so we calibrated this, the, the Mayos so they could do that. And it's actually quite fun because the audience realized that he's actually playing the pedal while playing the, the, the instrument. So it's possible to use any sensor technology to do that. I think it's very important that control, that when you design the interactive experiences, you know who is controlling what. And uh, so today, before we started the performance, I said, in the rehearsal, there was quite a, a nice thing that you did that was creating these sort of pan rhythmic things that I could follow. Um, so there are many ways that you can pass the button on to the performer. One of them is controlling the engine as well. But the, there are musical aspects as well that you can control. Um, yeah, but, um, is, uh, um, of course, it's possible, but do you try some, um, such kind of things that the um, uh, like the audio engine listen to uh, to the pitch which performer is uh, playing actually and for example if there are some sequence of some pitches yeah. so then the uh, such kind of uh, things going on, on, uh, on in real time in the real it's not possible unless you use OSC and then pipe to another object uh, another audio engine mm -hmm. but you can actually get the audio listener you can put an audio listener component and then use the dynamic, uh, the levels of the dynamic <coughs> audio coming in to control things. So we're using that in the um, first battle, first uh, round for um, um, the saxophone quartet, mm -hmm. using mouthpieces, like controlling one, mouth, one mouthpiece mm -hmm. with um, a certain contact mic attached, and then controlling another one. Mm -hmm. And the dynamic moves the animation, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a kind of a snake that moves um, and of course it produces a new sound that is pre-recorded and so on, you can pitch it as well. So it's possible to control and this is the most effective part of the engine. So, but this is, uh, this piece was from 2016 and at the time we didn't have that uh, possibility. Now we can do it in, within Unreal. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can show you a video of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and uh, last question. So, uh, because um, in uh, um, so this is like the f type of open uh, form composition. Yeah, this concept of open uh, open form. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 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 did you try also like so in normal compositions? There are very often the situation when you um, uh, going to some point and then you have the two or three possible choices mm -hmm. of continuation. So do you have also um, such pieces where the you or the performer decide what will going on next? Mm -hmm. So that, that the composition has a few forks yep. of, uh, on the development. Um, so like in like in uh, uh, in computer games, so you can go to this door and then the game is gone this way, or you can go to that door and the game will go another way. 
Well, it seemed like you had something like that in this world where you could kind of yeah, you zoom can, out and decide what part. You have a menu and you can go yeah. to any place, but I don't think this is a big choice to make um, mm-hmm. because you can you can just skip once. You know, you could have a shorter performance and skip one of them. Uh-huh. But I have a dynamic piece for a, a dynamic score piece for flute and, uh-huh. and clarinet. Uh-huh. I wrote for Stan Lamnick and Elizabeth Magnot, um, and I think uh, I. Elizabeth chooses the score. It's a kind of a Kate and Susie score where you reorder, mm-hmm. kind of a Mozart's Wolfram's build. So you, they have cards that they can learn. Mm-hmm. And then when she selects the pathway, the score is unfolded. Uh-huh. They don't know the order of the events, but they work with the mosaics to be sure that the contour is the same. And then when you arrange the, the tiles in between, it doesn't really matter so much. Mm-hmm. So you have to compose things in that way. But there are 11 possibilities for each of the scenes, and I try them all. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are hundreds of thousands. Mm-hmm. But I said, I know this tie cannot go after that one. Mm-hmm. So I don't use that combination. And this is very time consuming. Yeah. But I think the, the, the result is that performers love it because they, they think, first of all, they, they know that they are making decisions, although you are making the decisions, mm-hmm. they feel that way. And second, because they, every, time, every performance is more or less different. But you think about the overall phrase or the overall arc of the performance, it's the same. It means the same. It's like, a, I don't know, you are into architecture, but you look at the, the Gaudi benches in Barcelona. They, you look at the benches and they, they are, you just conceive the object at the macro level. But then you could think of these mosaics being reordered. And then you still perceive the bench, but it's a completely different object. Mm-hmm. You think about it. So the question, as a composer, is: What materials go where? What is what is a structure? What is microstructure or framework? What is mosaic tile? And then you think carefully about the materials you're composing. You can do that. And then if they are good improvisers, they they read the music. The counterpoint, of course, and is very precise. So it looks like it's all written. And then you need to find these ways of tiling the end of the phrase with the next one. But they're very good on that, and in fact we practice this. So, I, I haven't got that far here, because you know, I've been writing more instrumental music than, with electronics than interactive media works. But I think it's, it's possible to work at that macro level mm-hmm. in game engines. Um, in fact, in the base kind of piece where I put the bubbles, it works that way. So you can just go anywhere in the circle before you enter the Atomium Pavilion. And it sounds like a, it doesn't really matter. In fact, what I did is I put the same order. So you can go anywhere in the world. So you can go hit this ball here first, not like here, but you know. And then this other one, and then the last one. And I simply send in a counter. So you say, just count, count the collisions, and the collisions will trigger the events. So even if you play the, the, the experience 100 times differently, the order of the events will always be the same, because you have composed that part. So, I mean, a realist ideal for that. You have perception of freedom, but you hold control of materials as a composer. And that's very difficult to do in instrumental music. How, how much can you pass the baton onto these mm. fantastic guys? If you, you have problems saying, you know, you have a bit of an ego and want to say, this is my piece. Um, of course, if it's a shared improvisation, it's more like a, a shared piece. But it's possible. And there are techniques. Mm. Do you have any... What do you see, what do you look at when you, you see this kind of a scene, I'm curious? Do you ba- bounce back and forth, you, you view, between the real and the virtual, or...? The screen and what you're doing, and what she's okay. doing. But do you see a choreography between all the elements that belong together, or...? or not always. Not always, there's times where... And then you don't know what you're correct, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. There are synchronizations that are, are not there, that's fine. <coughs> I mean, you synchronize all the time, then you get the point, but you know, at some point. 
So, for example, in, in this thesis, the visual aspect and the synchronization of the, uh, between the audio and the visual is so strong that it kills the, the, the sonic part if you extend it for so long. So normally in the pieces I go from more visual content to less, to the point that at the very end I just release the engine. I, you don't see anything, maybe the fretboard, and then hopefully you will start ignoring the, the visuals because it become redundant, you start focusing more on the improvisation. I didn't feel particularly well improvising today. I think it was more, it was better yesterday. I don't know why, but you know, this is like gigs, you know, sometimes you just have a good gig. So it's, um, but I think it's very important that the visual experiences, the visual experience become redundant. And this is key. It's not just one thing I want to do. I haven't achieved that yet because the experience is very strong. But you don't need to desynchronize all the time. You synchronize a couple of times and people believe that the, 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 the collision triggers the event. So oh, you don't I mean more like if, like if you set up two random sequences, completely random, Visual now, your brain's going to make connections no matter what. And it wants mm. to, that's an interesting space. Is that me? Is that thing? And that mm. I mean, in the battles, we have a structure a little bit more what is the physical performer on both sides and okay. the virtual representation. So I think it's a bit unclear here, it's inconsistent. So one piece I have two, maybe in the next movement there's only one. <coughs> then in the battles, there's a sequencer there, it's only machine versus. Um, it's interesting composition, but I never thought across pieces. And I think it's it's, uh, it's a double sided sword because I quite like to see the uh, who the, the magic uh, lady there telling you the story. But then, what are we doing there? What is our part within the story? Um, so it's, I think it's, it's it's more interesting to work with the idea of the physical performers, both the electronic and, and, the, and the acoustic, and their virtual representation at all time. And then I will let you decide what did you look at. So that's your, your decision. And then I may create situations where I am going to be sure that you're going to look at the screen in front. Some others you will be sharing, because to understand the connection between the two, you need to keep an eye on but it's very difficult to know what we, how we experience because the uh, performance, because maybe this is something, this is a high, highly complex question to answer. I mean, I don't know what I, I normally close my eyes to be honest when I want to really get into the music. So how can you also facilitate that with such a strong visual image? Um, how could you, for example, in most of the pieces, I don't ask the performer to come at the beginning. So you can imagine a, a fantastic performer, like a top class performer, waiting in the backstage for seven minutes before they... That's not cool. Um, but then when, it, when uh, she comes or he comes to the performance stage, the piece just... Because then you see the virtual becomes real and then start, understand, start to understand what's going on there. You collected the instrument, you collected the performance, and then the performer comes. So the virtual decisions have a consequence in the real world. And this makes the pitch very strong. But some performers don't like that. So me, you know, I don't like being on stage, you know, backstage. You know, I commissioned you the piece not to put me in the back, you know. Um, so I think that works very well for the story, but maybe not so good for performance. Um, and if you have any other suggestions, things you can think of? I was wondering if uh, some sort of more embodied controller would be desirable, or if you just want to keep it very like, on the keyboard type of thing. I mean, it's a good question because I've been thinking about the, the, my interface. Mm. Uh, and in fact, I have a mechanical keyboard, so I have quite a few. And I have a commission, I commissioned a giant joystick mm. to the. Uh, yeah, McCurdy, so it's like a lovely, imagine like a huge jo joystick design, joypad. Um, but I'm thinking that I would like this to be performed, so eventually you can, anyone can download the, the install and then play. So I'm co trying to constrain myself through a physical keyboard. And this, this is why the navigation is a bit clumsy. You can see that the bird is not like it because now I'm using the keyboard. I could do that more smoothly, but I don't want to. 
But ideally, I might have my own interface in the future that is portable and uh, it just, for example, all the keys that I need, I cannot, I don't, we don't have enough keys unless you have a mechanical keyboard and then it has some extra ones. And, uh, but the interface is very important. And I think it's important that they see what you perform, how, how you do it. I mean, nothing, I'm, I'm not even thinking about necessarily like a game joystick because then you get more into the idea of this being a gamified experience. Mm -hmm. But then some sort of sensors or things like that that you can move your, like the lead motion, for example, mm -hmm. you can move, just move your hand in front of the screen and just have yeah. more control over things. We actually use the lead motion for yeah. the first versions for, of the people. Yeah. And also we have another avatar for uh, violin. Mm -hmm. virtuoso. Mm -hmm. And it works it works okay for some things, but you know some not for some others. Yeah. It doesn't really do well the fingering. Um, it, it works well if you do that, but when you do the fingering it, it, it creates a kind of a sense of that. It doesn't mm -hmm. and also do you want to represent the real world? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, you know. Most people are going into this direction representing the real world. I don't want to. I think it's more exciting to see things that we can imagine that are mechanical instruments that can be played. So, for example, in the uh, sequence uh, scene with the saxophone players, we have mechanical metronomes made of part of the instrument. And they can be controlled at any time, any rate, um, and sequenced. And this is a lot of fun. And we've, we thought about doing something which is more like a sequ normal sequencer, like uh, it works because they are humanized, they look like puppets that move around, yeah. but you can create really highly complex polyrhythms that I try first to max. So I make my matrix and I start doing these things with a uh, uh, 3, 4, you know, so 12 bar. Um, and then I say, okay, I have this working, I like this rhythm, I, I take a picture of the pattern and then I compose that with these mechanical metronomes. So they have the illusion that they are performing and when they are funny and so on, but the, but the metronomic aspect is, it works really well. Of course, the scheduler, in, the audio scheduler in, in Unreal is this rubbish, so after a while it starts becoming synchronized, desynchronized, which is interesting as well. But ideally you should do that in Choc or <coughs> elsewhere. So in this particular improvisation, how is the sound of the team uh, all controlling music visual experience and how are you mm, uh, tweaking the sound like synthesizing or relating? Mm. I think in, the, in this particular one there's not much uh, procedural audio if that's what you mean it's mostly sample based but in the original version that we didn't use because OSC is not implemented for 421 yet mm. Uh, it's just simply be the, for example, the position of the strings. You place the notes, you know, like guitar hero, can, the notes come to you, but it's a very gamified experience. So the idea was to create these, these buttons that play the note. So I have a trigger here, which is a Sangai tower that goes up and down. So basically, oscillators, a bunch of oscillators in PED can pass all the way around. The position of the um, bottom, the, the Shanghai Tower that goes up and down in the, in the fretboard is passing the position onto an oscillator and becoming the frequency of it. So you can go up and forth. But you can use that for modulation if you have more than one. Moving up and down it creates a very interesting effect that you can still recognize it. And then it has trigger effects as well. So for example, they have uh, invisible triggers that when the tower goes and passes by and touches this, this note, this is the finger position, uh, destroys the object and triggers one sound. I do that when I play alone, this piece, so I didn't, didn't disconnect that because she was kind of doing that live. Um, so the connection is mostly, the, the, the counterpoint is mostly sonic, like you know, two guys going physically there to perform together. In this particular performance. So the sound of the the pickup of the pipa is just being amplified. You're not 
processing it or using it I to control the graphics or anything like that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, in Max, I have a kind of a 160 samples here. And then I have a sort of underneath patch with a little bit of sound processing. But I don't have a MIDI controller, so it was kind of set yesterday in final. So basically using a recording variable loop, delay lines, harmonizer, and granular synthesis, and uh, filters. It's a very basic patch that you normally you know you can use in any situation. But you're applying all those effects to your own samples, not to the live. No, to the live only. Oh, okay. So you are you are processing yeah. the people. Yeah, a little bit. You could hear that more in the, in the very final part when I just push it. Um, there was something with the mapping, the sounds were too far behind. But the, the, the max part is very basic, it's kind of a... So have the basic aspects of the uh, gestures that you would do with, in a pipa. With all the variations that you can add to. These ones are Grisaldi, so you can use that when she's doing this. And they're random, so... Then they have all the wooden material. She was bringing and I was just coming back. ones are kalimba, so the, the pipa is, is a nice instrument but it doesn't have any metallic quality to it, so I just found a bora kalimba for my daughter, because of the, it's pitch transpose and everything, so it's really nice sustained sound that complements very nicely the, and every time I play it, it's very nice different, so it creates very nice, so it's not highly complicated but the thing is very effective. And then I have mapped the entire, uh, when I work with Yuhe Liu, this is the original musician I work with, I mapped the entire instrument with all the different techniques note by note. Every string, every technique. So if I pl place them uh, randomly, I can create kind of... Maybe do things that in the pipa would not be possible. And then we did that in the very last part. Um, and apart from that, there's, not, there's nothing else really. Well, you can play things together. So it creates kind of a nice gesture from time to time. I think we play too much today. I think the other day we play less, I think was less is more. So, but every time you play... It's... So live processing, all the sample things, and all the real sounds. So the real sounds are 5.1, but for some reason it wasn't working today. But you can use Piper per one to, especially if you navigate and then you move around. It's quite nice to see you hit the sound and then you move, move left and right. So you can do that with the bird and then you get this sort of sense of space and specialization. It's very effective. So you have enough resources. And the reason why I use a second machine is because when you, normally is, um, you design the different levels or different scenes in different levels. Because you put everything in one single scene, it's, it's too heavy to render the, you know, too many words. But when you move from, when you load a new scene, sound automatically stops. So it does, it's quite nasty. And I haven't solved that problem yet. That's why I was fading down sometimes. It was not very good. But then I used the other machine to put an, a layer in between. So you sort of fake the transition. Otherwise, it sounds like <coughs> And then it takes a while to load the image. So you normally will open the, the engine and will load all the scenes. Because the first time you load it, it takes a while. The second time, it, it takes a few seconds. Mm. And if it crashes, you can also go to a specific scene. You know when it crashes once, the concert? <laughs> and sometimes it crashes twice. <laughs> it's a bit unusual. But it doesn't matter, we crashed twice in, in Valencia, and then we didn't have enough time to debug everything. And then we did a this at the end, so kind of a, a last uh, scene. And people like that a lot. So, so well, it's just a matter of having enough resources, and in the same way you would do it if you perform live with Super Collider or with any other tool. Um, and don't get too fussy about crashing, you know, crash all the time. <laughs> we break um, 
strings when you perform, you know, seeing concertinos as breaking strings and then getting the string from the next player, uh, then the violin. Yes. So, what do you both see in the images? Like, so, what do you, how do you experience them as performers? Beyond just being scores and fixed points. Mm. What would you like? What would you like more of? What would you like less of? Yeah, uh, I did some improvisation before, yeah. and but no visual cues. Mm. And I think visual cues are really helpful. And uh, so sometimes, like delay, <laughs> I can like yeah, yeah uh, impact pretty fast. So, but it's fine. I think it's it's and. There are a lot of times to do this. Yeah, and this is like, I've never seen like the visual of my instrument <laughs> show, yeah. showing here. So, yeah. so you like that? Just yeah. play against the visual instrument? Mm -hmm. And like the max, uh, his max composure, like he can play something like I cannot do mm -hmm. by that time. So <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty funny. But if you turn away from the audience, you can pretend. Go down to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, like, if you, if you didn't know, you can, you cannot, like, differentiate the, this, mm. this one. I think uh, from the, my performance, um, I, I have to fix a few things. Yeah. One is very useful, which is the fact that we have a, a very developed cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, we've had this experience of watching movies and so on. And the camera can be very effective navigating the space. Mm -hmm. But I do that manually, which is fun, but you don't see that well. Yeah. So I can automate that to create a kind of a guide, and that's easy to do. You can trigger and maybe navigate the pipa yeah. there and so on. But then I will not have the freedom to just do another loop around for mm -hmm. some. So I could like to semi-automate the, the visual experience. But I think navigating the space with a camera is something that has a lot of musical potential. So, and there's a lot of questions about how, where is the camera, who owns it? Is that the, because um, originally before the bird, I had a, a pipa as the first person shooter. So you could see like the guy you know, moving and the, the head was the pipa. And it was funny for a while, but then after a while, like, no. And then, because the sound of the pipa is not that rich, it's like writing a piece for a novel. You know, you really struggle if you work with electronics. So I found that the this, this synthesized bird was within the story, mm -hmm. and I could create fantastic sounds with it. And I also think, like, there might, there, if there more hint before the video cues, maybe more helpful. Mm -hmm. like, like the baby pond uh, flower mm -hmm. thing, if I think, or, or if I'm more familiar with the videos, yes. maybe we can better. Mm -hmm. But my experience, I don't know, it's a bit um, a bad experience because I have, to have, I have to keep an eye on so many other things going on that you can lose the perspective. So I try to, the more I learn the piece, the, the, the more I enjoy performing it, let's put it this way. Because there are too many things that I could solve automatically and, and, and also when you perform with someone, you are not just just trying to keep the, the conversation fine. It's just you really want to engage. So you have to do is release yourself from all that stuff and then start listening. And that's difficult when you get lost, when you, you crash, when, when you have to keyboard. Sometimes I doing things in this keyboard, I should be doing it in this other keyboard. And I don't know why. I say, why is it not working? Um, but there are solutions for that. I mean, uh, Yeah, no, it's just interesting between the two projects. Uh, I don't know, something Constantine was talking about, like the embodiment, like maybe it's, a, it's another, hmm. I don't know, in terms of the camera to, to, and the angle of that navigation, it's like a live avatar or some, like someone else that is embodying that, hmm. that is directing that, the musicians or something. That's the bit that, hmm. I don't know, because then we stop looking at you guys as what's the cue with somebody else. They don't actually have to be doing anything, but it's almost like if they're moving, it can seem like they're controlling the camera angle from... You know what, I think yeah. we musicians, we don't understand that part. At least I don't. Yeah. And maybe you are very good on the visual side. 
but in the same way, I collaborated with uh, 3D modelers here. That, you know, yeah, I, I sketched the, 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 the 3D models, and I do that professionally. Both the rigging and, and the 3D models, they're fantastic, they're low poly, they, 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 they're very light. Yeah. And I do all the mechanics in the game engine. The, the, uh, I think it would be good to collaborate with someone from, from the theatre background. Yeah. They know about the staging, you know, kind of people like probably uh, talk with um, Cirque du Soleil or one of these guys that designs spectacles, they design big shows for pop music or something and see or ask people what is a more gratifying experience when they see what sort of things really work so well because I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm qualified to do it I'm, I don't know I'm stuck in that aspect and I think it's important in the saxophone quartet in battle they were dressing in white, and then we had fluorescent lights, so they became like kind of a fluorescent purple. So we designed the scenes exactly in the same settings. And that worked really, really well, because it was kind of a box mm -hmm. that way. So you don't see the difference between the two spaces. And this is just a light issue. You know, it's something that you can solve with someone that knows about lighting and a little bit of um, concept design for a stage. Once you get the two, the physical and the virtual, occupying the same space from the listener perspective, then you tend to believe that this is it's not just two pieces, it's just one. So you don't look at, you don't see, I was asking, what are you looking at there? there? You, don't, you don't look at, you just see. And therefore you listen more in a more integrated way. Um, but the problem is that when you go to different theaters, they work differently, and then sometimes they don't have lights, so they, you know, the, the screen is too high. Or so ideally, this has to be a very controlled performance. But when you get these pop musicians, this touring, they they all have their own system. They don't rely on anyone else. They go there, they you know they they do the setup and they strike and they go next day next time. So I think this is something that with a small gig, so a small, small rig, uh, this control, vis visuals, projectors, lighting, staging, it can be really effective without spending much money. It's more the concept, I think. I, I realize that it works very well if the screen is slightly higher than this one. And this size is actually quite good, but we should be further mm -hmm. uh, forward, closer to the scene. Mm -hmm. We performed once in uh, Mexico, in Pachuca, in a theater with 650 seats. And they, it's the largest screen I've seen in my life, They're huge. It's so tiny that it didn't make any sense, mm -hmm. it didn't work. But it was like visually very strong. Mm -hmm. Who do you think could help to, to build a, a concert experience? I what sort think, of people? I think somebody in more, because you have the, the problem of venue, what, you, what you're going to come up with, someone more in sort of like a, a sort of minimalist theater background where they can use a single object mm. of whatever they find very quickly to sort of bind separate elements very quick. Because the spectacle is always about more. Whereas if you're going into a situation where you you have want control less. over the sound, whatever. Yeah. You want a single object that goes quick, unifies all the paths. Mm. I was just thinking about of the video because this was very much like two performers in yeah. a video, and just one thing that one if there was one other person that I'm confused whether they're the video or a performer, then all of a sudden it recasts your guy's role as well, mm. and then I can, yeah. So it's like a single object. I don't know, if I, like, off the top of my head, if I was doing something very quick in here, just like a, a, a sheet that went from the screen to your positions, something that just, you don't actually, it doesn't have to mean anything or you don't know, but you just know that this is the performance space, not this. Yeah. 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 So I don't know, that kind of minimalist theater tradition of like a single thing that quickly binds everybody. Definitely somebody in Manchester doing that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, we also try the interfaces with the Kinect 2, which is quite yeah. precise. So that could be a possibility. Just to yeah, something simple like that, that all of a sudden, like at one moment, just turns. Yeah. yeah. And then you need to have a specific background to do that. And then, so it works well in the studio. Once you go to a concert hall, there's no <laughs> more complications. Yeah. yeah. So, but thank you anyway for, for your suggestions. I think it's